yeah, I have to confess that when they asked me to prepare this presentation, I thought a lot about what to say. Uh, because, I mean, uh, I think that most of the uh, important aspects about EV isolation, characterization, and so on have been covered already by people, the previous speaker, that probably are more uh, experienced than me. So, uh, finally, I decided to uh, consider the EU as students that they can come to the lab. And I was thinking about what I will I would say to these students coming. So I will give you some tips that I would like to give to the students. So I will speak about the things that I do in the lab and if I will be able, I will give you some tips about that. Um, so this is something that you already know for sure. Uh, so basically when we uh, characterize extracellular vesicles, we can use several uh, way, several techniques uh, that are divided in biochemical techniques and physical techniques. Of course, I cannot cover all of them because of time and because I'm not expert on uh, all of them. But about biochemical, simply I will tell you something about total protein uh, um, investigation and immunoblotting. Uh, you know that this is a typical cartoon of an extracellular vesicles, and we have a lot of vesicle, uh, a lot of proteins inside of the vesicles, but also uh, on the membrane. So what we can uh, uh, investigate, obviously, uh, is the protein cargo of the vesicles, and we have several uh, ways to do this. One, the easiest way is to do the immunoblot, the the easiest one is the Western blot. I guess that all of you knows what is a Western blot. And we have also the immunosorbent EV assays. So this is uh, a typical Western blot. I guess that most of you have done that. And this is just an example uh, where we loaded the cell lysate and two type of extracellular vesicles, large and small. And in this case, we investigated the HER2, but it's not important for the message that I want to give you. What is important is that I think that most of you will tell me that here we really have an enrichment of a HER2 in the, in the vesicles, that this is what we would like to show in this kind of project. But the thing is, uh, uh, this protein is really more uh, present in the vesicles than in the cells. We cannot say that because we don't have anything to compare with. I mean, when we, have, uh, when we normally do Western blot on the cell lysate, we compare the, the protein that we are interested about with something that is uh, uh, expressed at the same level in all uh, cells. But this doesn't happen in the vesicles. So one thing that we can do is probably something obvious, but not everybody do this, is to look at the total protein that you loaded. And in this case, for example, you can see that also if you see a band here, looking at the total protein that we loaded here is definitely not so much. I mean, we got something, but the amount of total protein is, an, is not really high. Differently from large and small vesicles where you see that we loaded proteins and we got a huge band. So finally, we cannot say a lot, at least about quantification. We can only say that we have or we don't have. Um, and again, how we can solve this problem? We can solve if we use the total protein that we loaded on the gel and we make the uh, comparison. So this is just an, another example. This is, these are vesicles example isolated by size exclusion chromatography. In this case, we look at that this protein, CD147. Um, and to say if we really have more or less of this protein, as I said, we did the comparison. So each lines compared with the bands that we were interested about. And finally, we ended up with this graph that we published. So in these samples that in our case were coming from HER2 positive uh, breast cancer patients, we really have an enrichment or an increased amount of um, CD147 
uh, protein in the vesicles. And then other things that I want to, the tip that I want to give you is that, okay, since we have to follow the MICEF guideline, we struggle a lot to do the Western blot, to investigate the proteins, and specifically, we look at typical marker of extracellular vesicles. These are just examples. Again, cell lysate, large vesicles, small vesicles. In this case, there are EV isolated from tumor tissue. And we investigate a typical marker of EV, like CD63, flotilin, and so on. But what I want to show you is this, for example, that in these samples coming from uh, um, melanoma uh, tissue, we found CD9 in cell lysate as well as large EV, small EV. But in this case, another sample, but still melanoma uh, tissue, we do not find uh, CD9. And the message is, okay, try to find the uh, tetraspanin in this case that are typical of extracellular vesicles. But if you don't find them, it's not the end of the world. I mean, it's simply the samples are different. Um, another example about how we can uh, uh, look at the proteins in the vesicles is, for example, doing the ELISA. I guess that most of you know. So we have an antibody on the surface, then we load the vesicles, then we load the secondary antibody, and then we have something to uh, quantify uh, if uh, uh, the marker is present or not. Simply, but as all they say, we have to optimize them and we have also be careful. This is just an example. So I don't, of course it's not important, the numbers are not important. This is just to say that here I was looking for some samples and I was uh, looking at this marker, MTCO2, and when I subtracted uh, what I collected from the blank, in this case it was PBS, I got negative numbers. So it means, okay, there, there are no, uh, I don't have vesicles that are positive for this marker. But good that I repeated it, just increasing the amount of vesicles. So in these cases, I loaded 10 to 8 particles, and I got nothing. When I loaded 10 to 9 particles, you can easily see that, okay, these samples was negative, but the others, as expected, they had uh, this uh, uh, marker on the surface, and I confirmed this by Western Lot as well. What is the problem with this assay? Uh, what I don't like, to be honest, but this is what it is, is that this type of assay gives you just a number, so you have to uh, believe in it. But nothing is visible, so you have just to believe in some numbers, so that they are higher, smaller, but nothing is visible. Another sort of uh, sophisticated ELISA that we can run is this single particle interferometric reflected image sensor. Quite difficult name, but commercially it's called ExoView. As I said, it's a sort of sophisticated ELISA, so we have a chip with antibodies on the surface, we load the vesicles, and then we have a secondary antibody that we can detect. Very simple, but the beauty of this is that the vesicles are visible on the chip. So this is just an example. So here we uh, got the positivity for some markers, CD81, CD63, whatever. But again, we were interested about HER2. And if you look at the HER2 in, uh, in, in red, I mean, it was not really so well present. So the question was, uh, can we believe in this short, in this small amount of vesicles? If, uh, to be honest, if I will get this by ELISA, I'm not so sure that I can believe in it because it is just a number that I don't know. But the good things with this uh, technique is that you can see the vesicles that are on the chip. And here you can check that basically there is nothing strange, the vesicles are there, you don't notice any aggregates or some parts that are really empty. I mean, these things are empty, but they are part of the chip, so you don't expect to have anything there. And also you can ask the machine, please 
show me only the vesicles that are positive for HER2. And in this case, there were only these. So finally, coming back to the uh, bars that I showed you before, these are the corresponding chips. So in the patients that they were uh, HER2 negative, we got 205 red spot. In the patients that they were HER2 positive, we got triple amount of this positivity. So I think that I convinced you that, okay, we have to confirm these results with other system, but at least when you see something, it's more believable. If you just read a number, you don't know what you say. And let's go to the physical, two type at least, of physical system that we, or method that we have to uh, characterize vesicles. And I will tell you just a few tips about nanoparticle tracking analysis, and then I will say something about transmission electron microscopy. So nanoparticle tracking analysis, probably something that some of you use in the lab, is a machine based on the Brownian motion of the vesicles and it's able to tell you the concentration of the particles. The problem is that the machine is not able to distinguish the real particles or the aggregates or whatever. But anyway, it's, it's really well used because it's easy to use. And with the nanoparticle tracking analysis, this is what we get. So these are the particles that are moving and basically on this movement, the machine tell you the concentration of the particles. And so you get these results, and in particular, you can see the concentration of your particles per ml, as well as the median of the size. So, so far, so good. You also have the distribution of the particle size. And to be honest, most of us just, we are happy when we get these numbers and we can use for the rest of the experiment. But I, the message that I want to give you is that we have to be, we can get much more information from this machine. So first of all, this is the entire PDF file that you get. And for example, you can already notice something strange here. So this is, I don't know, probably an aggregate or yeah, something strange that the machine doesn't count. As well as you get five, uh, four uh, uh, files from the machine. And I want to tell you that if you have time, and you should have, look at all the files that the machine give you. For example, again, looking at the PDF file, you can notice that here there is something strange. So there are no particles. But still, uh, you have the concentration of particles, and it's also quite good concentration, but what's wrong here? If you look at the video, you can see that here there is nothing, here there is something, and then the, there is nothing or just few particles. The point is that the machine counts 11 positions, and it can be that some positions are not good for some reason, the machine is dirty or something is going wrong. So the message is you still have the number of particles and you are happy about, but these uh, numbers in this case is not believable. And if you look, oops, sorry. I don't know what happened. Okay. If you look properly, this is the text file. The machine just counted in this case only for four position out of 11. So I suggest you to repeat the analysis because it's not going well. And then finally, the electron microscopy. I guess that all of you know what an electron microscopy is. It's a way to look at the vesicles. We have different type of electron microscopy techniques. And just to mention you that we have the scanning electron microscopy that look at the surface, in this case of the vesicles. But I will not tell you anything about because I don't, I'm not expert at all in uh, scanning electron microscopy. But I did quite a lot of transmission electron microscopy. This is the uh, transmission electron microscopy, this big guy where you have the uh, electron beams that arrive on the samples and then to the scatter you will see uh, the, the vesicles in our case. This is <clears throat> a typical picture of uh, uh, EV by electron microscopy, for sure not the best ever, but this is a real example. I mean. I can tell you that when you acquire a picture uh, uh, of vesicles, most of them are not so beautiful as you see in the, in the paper. Of course, we choose the best one. Most of them are like this. 
and the ability or what we have to think about is what we count to be a vesicles and what not. And then there is the big question about sites. In my way to look at the vesicles, I don't consider the sites just when I look at the, the vesicles. So everything full of this criteria for me is a vesicles. But about sites is a big problem in negative stain. From my experience, we can look at the sites by negative stain, electron microscopy. Honestly, it's the only way that we have so far to really look at vesicles, sites, also if it has some limitation. But again, sites is a problem. For example, this is uh, another EM picture of extracellular vesicles. This is probably much better than the others that I show. It. So this is publishable, in my opinion. But what we notice here, that for example, as all of you know, these two guys has the typical cup shape of extracellular vesicles. And this is normal that happened with this technique because we have a fixation and dridation of the samples. So the vesicles, mostly the big one, collapse. And this makes problem when you want to count the sites, you want to calculate the sites because it's, anyhow, it's not uh, normal because we have this problem. And another problem is that as you can see in this picture, we have that the vesicles overlap with each other. For example, here you can distinguish a vesicles inside of a Birger vesicles, or here as well. So the big question is, if I want to calculate the sites of these vesicles, how I can do? For example, in this case, I can calculate these diameters, but probably it's not true, because here I have another vesicles. Or maybe I can choose to look at these diameters, but again, I don't know exactly where these vesicles, where, where is the limit? So we have to keep in mind that there is a problem. But anyway, Still, the transmission electron microscopy and the negative stain technique is possible to be used to look at the sites at the vesicles, but again, follow of the mice have guideline where people say that to, to look at the sites, we have to show a sufficient number of overview image as well as we have to show the um, close-up image to really show what we have. And just a few words about the protocol to do uh, uh, negative stain. So what, this is the grids, the small grids where we put the vesicles on or in general the, uh, the, the transmission electron microscopy samples. And then what we do is to make the grids hydrophilic, then we load the samples, then we fix the samples, and then we use uh, a heavy metal salt to make the samples visible because you have to think about that the electrons arrive on the samples and then they have to be scattered. If you have nothing that makes contrast, you don't see anything. And all these passages, also if they are really few, they can make a big difference. We just ask ourselves how we have to load the samples on the grids. Because simply you can choose to put the grids on the drop where we, you have the vesicles, or you can put the grids on the table and then the drop on, of the samples on the grids. So basically you can have this or this. Stupid things, but probably it makes difference. And we not, to be honest, we didn't notice a, such a big difference, but in our experience, it seems that when we put the grids on top of the vesicles, we have a better yield, maybe because when we have the drop, the vesicles will be distributed on the surface of the, of the drop. And another important step is the fixation. Uh, I decided to look at this because, to be honest, in my opinion, it's not necessary. I mean, if you try to skip this passage, you will still see vesicles on the grids. It's super important when you do immunogold, for example, but this is another story. For the normal negative stain, it's not necessary at all, but people do that. So we try to see what happens if we do fixation or if we don't do fixation. And with surprise, for me, to be honest, we see that we have more vesicles on the grids if we have a fixation. So if we introduce the step of glutaral diet in this case, then when we don't have it. And finally, 
the, uh, the, the last step to make the samples evident, visible under the microscope. And one of the things that we do is to use uranyl acetate. It's toxic, it's radioactive, so use as less as possible. And be super careful because this is just the overview of grids that you can see under the microscope when you have a really low mag. And immediately I noticed that here there was something strange. What was wrong here? It happened that I got uranyl acetate precipitate, these uh, black dots that you see, this is another uh, um, example, these are uranyl precipitate. So I'm pretty sure that for people that they do electron microscopy on vesicles, it happened that you end up with these things. These things are most of the time uranyl acetate precipitate that happen if the uranyl is old, in the best scenario should be prepared fresh all the time, and if you don't filtrate it. This is quite stupid to say, but for electron microscopy, you have to filtrate everything. Otherwise, under microscope, everything is super big and it will cover your samples. So, repeating and repeating, uh, follow the MySAF guideline um, and use several techniques to characterize and quantify the vesicles. Here are the papers that I use it to prepare this presentation, just if you want to know more about what I said, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>